All right, time for the Geology 12 Unit D test review. Here we go. Uh, lots of stuff to get through, actually. We'll start with the first part of the unit, geologic time. And so what we see here are the principles. And these principles of stratification are, are very important to understand in the unit because in relative age, what we need to do is determine which layer is older than which other layer. And if we go down to an example, let's start with an example. Uh, we can see there's some some problems here because uh, first of all the simplest the simplest layering that we could see would would be horizontal layers like layers six seven and eight where each one is deposited horizontally the one on top is going to be younger than the one underneath and that makes for fairly simple uh, age determinations so it, if it were just layers six seven and eight we would say six is the oldest seven is the middlest and eight is the youngest. And we can make that determination because of uh, the principles of superposition and also original horizontality. Original horizontality meaning that the layers were deposited horizontally initially and that any layer that's deposited on top of a layer must be younger. The underlying layer must have pre preceded it. Now, the problem is we can see uh, layers one, two, and three don't look like they were deposited horizontally. In fact, they were. Original horizontality tells us they were that they were deposited horizontally, but something must have happened, and we can see the answer here. Uh, there was a tilting that occurred, and this could have resulted from a number of different tectonic uh, or isostatic forces. And so something caused it to tilt, and then some uh, some erosion force probably cut this off, leveled it, just like all mountains or hills are eventually leveled. Uh, we can see that this is cut off. We see exposed at the surface, layers 1, 2, and 3 angled. Um, and the only way that we can know that 1 is younger than 2 is based on this angle. If it were actually vertical, we would have no clue which is younger. But we always, we always figure that whatever the angle is, the, the, the sh hmm, how do we say this? Whatever is underneath that angle is going to be an older layer. Okay, just like we would also make that determination here. Again, I, I wouldn't give you something where there was a vertical line here because I, I would have no clue how to make that determination. So we can tell because of this line that this layer, number one, must be older than two, two must be older than three. Um, then what must have happened, because we have something, this line here that separates layer three from layer six, or layers one, two, and three from layer six, and this we call an unconformity. This is an angular unconformity, and what's going on here is the tilting must have occurred, then there was erosion, it cut this off level, and then we had this, this, uh, this series of redepositions. Layers 6, 7, and 8 were deposited. Finally, cross-cutting relationships. That principle tells us that if layer 9 is cutting through these layers, all other layers must have pre-existed. So that would make number 9 the, uh, the youngest layer here. Where this gets tricky, though, is what if this were cut off and only went as far as 7? Um, we would make the determination that, uh, that probably layer uh, 8 is actually younger than layer 9 simply because it doesn't cut through it. I w again, I wouldn't give you something like that most likely. Uh, this one is, is fairly evident because it cuts through all existing layers. We know that it must be the youngest layer. Okay, so that covers most of these, not all of these. Um, uh, we didn't talk about included fragments. And we might see that there's small rocks or xenoliths inside of 9 as that intrusion works its way th up a crack and uh, cuts effectively cuts through these layers, it's probably going to pull some of that country rock or um, pre-deposited rock into it. And so these xenoliths that would form uh, must be older than the intrusion itself. Most of these principles actually make pretty good common sense uh, once, you, once you read through them. It's just, it's just trying to understand them all together that can be somewhat confusing. There's a few examples, work through them, they're all in here. Uh, okay, faulting. And faulting works the same as an intrusion. If a fault cuts through layers, then those layers must have pre-existed the fault. In other words, the fault couldn't have cut through them if the layers weren't already there. And so in terms of relative age, the fault must be younger than the layers that it cuts through. Uh, it can be tricky where you see a fault and then subsequent to the fault, uh, there's more deposition. Uh, and I don't know if I have an example that looks like that here. I don't think I do. Okay. Oh, wait a second. Here's one. Look at that. So we can see that there was deposition that occurred. And then there was a fault. Then there was some weathering process. We can see some xenoliths here. 
those xenoliths must have preceded this layer. In other words, the xenoliths are older than the layer in which they're included, included fragments. Uh, and then so finally, these top two layers were deposited. Is this uh, an unconformity? Well, we can see certainly on, on this side, we're missing this layer. This layer should have been uh, should have been here. And so without doubt, there is an unconformity or a break in the rock record, at least here. There may also be here, but we would need more fossils to, to prove that, or we need some fossils to prove that. Okay, let's keep going here. Okay, which of the following would be the most likely fossil found in layer two? So what we would need to do is go to our trusty sheets here. And uh, if we go to page two, you're going to get a copy of these, by the way, in the test. You can see including the half-lives as well, too. This is exactly what you're going to get uh, for, uh, for reference. So we'll start with uh, this guy right here, which I hope you recognize as being a brachiopod. It is parallel, so it's not a mollusk. The mollusks are not uh, 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 symmetrical. Not, I shouldn't say parallel, symmetrical. Okay, so let's see what we got here. That guy lived uh, in the Devonian. So if we go to the next sheet, we see the Devonian right here. And we would expect that the layer underneath should be from the Silurian. Okay. And so just to prove that, let's go down to the Graptolite here, which is in layer three. And let's get a time period for that. There it is. It's Ordovician. All right. And we said we we're missing the Silurian, we think. And sure enough, there is the Ordovician. So we've got a fossil from the Ordovician. We've also got a fossil from the Devonian. We are missing the Silurian. Okay, and the most likely fossil, we just need to find one that matches the Silurian, and there it is. It's, uh, wow. Yeah, and so, yeah, that would be the fossil that we'd expect it. The answer should be A. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. We always expect that unless there's an unconformity, each subsequent layer should be represented by a time period and should have index fossils uh, specific to that time period. Okay, oh, this is a tricky one. I think the answer is given here. Um, let's just talk about it briefly. Original horizontality and superposition tells us that the layers in unit S must have been deposited first. That would have happened first. Then there was, um, well, what was next? Was there a fault next or was there an intrusion next? Uh, because the fault does not cut through the intrusion, we would anticipate that the intrusion was next. Okay, so the oldest should be S. Next to that should be the intrusion M. I'm sorry, next to that should be the, intru uh, the fault F. Then the intrusion M. And then finally, uh, the, the intrusion I. Hopefully that's the answer. Let's just go down and check, make sure I got that right. You can look up the answer here. Okay, what's the most accurate age range for the sandstone layer? Okay, this, yeah, these ones should be fairly straightforward. Um, but what we can do, we need to look at what's older and what's younger. We know that the next youngest layer, uh, we know that this cuts through it, so it's got to be uh, older than 100 million years. And it must be younger than the underlying layer which is 180 million years, MY being million years. So our, our age would be, our age range would be 100 to 180, which is uh, D. Okay, locate the unconformity. And again, we want to find a break in the rock record. We don't need to use the reference materials for this one because we can see that there's green shale, gray sandstone, and tan limestone. Here we see there's green shale, tan limestone. We can see we're missing the gray sandstone. So this line here, must be an unconformity, the line between the green shale and the tan limestone. And we see the same thing happening here. We could verify that though. Let's, let's have some fun and verify this with the sheets. Okay, just to prove that that's the right answer. And so I'll keep the reference over here. And what we're gonna look for is that shell, which is the tertiary. So we'll go up here, there's the tertiary. Then we see the gray sandstone, which is also the tertiary, but it's Eocene. So we've got Oligocene and Eocene. Oligocene, Eocene, and so we would expect that this would be the Paleocene, also the tertiary. Let's look it up, and there it is, Paleocene, okay. Um, and so now if we look at this next one, this is where we'll see that there's a problem because we already determined that this one 
was from the Oligocene, okay? This is from the Eocene, it's missing. And finally, we've got the Paleocene here in this, uh, in this mollusk. Okay, uh, hopefully that, uh, that makes sense. Okay, let's go through the next one. I'll try to get through as many of them as I can here. So now we get into some absolute aging, uh, evolution, okay, yep, okay, the Catholic part of this, which I found particularly interesting, hopefully you did as well too, skip through all of this, keep going, keep going, okay, I suppose I could have removed a lot of this, wow, okay, Shroud of Turin, again, absolutely staggering, incredible, but but we won't be tested on that, well, you won't be tested on that, okay, then we get to this uh, chart and this you need to know you need to know which came first all right which are the oldest know the order of these uh, make sure that you review that okay then we went into the different theories I won't be spending a lot of time on this other than to know who f or, or what process finally lead led to the uh, the determination of the accurate age of the earth and uh, uh, yes so there we go what else from this is testable Yo, this you should know for sure. Make sure you know that. Okay, that was quick. All right. Uh, to be. This is PowerPoint to be. I won't say to be or not to be. I know that gets annoying when people say that. So I, I definitely won't do it. Okay, carbon. What is carbon? It's a sixth atom on the periodic table, meaning it has six protons, six electrons, and six neutrons. Carbon-14 is an isotope of carbon that contains six protons. Now let's pause for a second. Its atomic mass is 14, that's hence the 14 uh, after the C. And the properties of that element are determined by the protons. So if we change the number of protons, it would, it would seem to make sense if we were to reason through this that C14 should have seven neutrons and seven protons. Well, that's not the case because as soon as we go to seven protons, because protons determine, again, the properties of that element, it's no longer carbon. Carbon only exists in any of its forms, whether isotopic or normal C12. It can only exist in that format if it has six protons. You change the protons, you change the element. So that makes it simple. We know as soon as we see carbon, it has six protons no matter what. C13 has seven neutrons, but still six protons. C14, still six protons, but now it's got eight neutrons. And if we add six and eight, of course, we get that C14. The, uh, there's also six electrons, but electrons really make um, no discernible significant difference to the atomic mass. The atomic mass is, is mostly determined by the number of neutrons and protons. Okay, what happens to carbon-14? Well, when it, uh, when it finally does spontaneously radioactively decay, it transmutes into nitrogen-14. Now, as soon as we see nitrogen, we know that it's the next element and so it has seven neutrons and it has seven protons. Uh, okay, hopefully that makes sense. I wouldn't ask you this. Well, maybe I would ask you this, but uh, uh, C14 is a one in a trillion isotope. So in other words, we need, would need to count a trillion atoms of carbon before we would find a single C14. It's, it's, it's remarkable. It's, 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 a, it's a needle in a haystack kind of, uh, well, a needle in multiple haystacks. It's amazing that uh, it's possible for them to, to count that accurately with such a, a relatively small number. Okay, uh, let's see. Carbon-14, what is carbon dating? Yeah, hopefully you remember the video. Uh, what is radiometric dating? So radiometric dating is where we actually make a, determine, a determination of the relative age, or the, so I'm sorry, the absolute age, based on the proportions of the parent to daughter materials. So let's use this chart. And we can, without knowing, without seeing this element U, uh, the half-life, uh, in other words, the half-life in time, T for time, is equal to 10 years. We don't even need to know that because we can look at the uh, daughter or the parent product, which at time zero is 100%. In other words, all of the radioactive, uh, radioactive atoms all of them are currently in, in, in the parent form. None have transmuted yet at time zero. So as time progresses, we can see we get to a point 
where the daughter products indicated by the curve that starts down here at the bottom at zero, where they intersect, if we slide right down to time, that tells us the half-life. Okay, so 50% of all of the atoms have now transmuted uh, or spontaneously radioactively decayed. And if we extrapolate straight down, that time, or in years in this case, represents a half-life. So half of them have transmuted or half of them have radioactively decayed at time 10. Now this is where things get very interesting and strange. If, okay, let's say we had 100 atoms. After 10 years, 50 of them have radioactively decayed. Wouldn't you expect that after another 10 years, the other 50 decay? Well, that's not the case. Only half of the remainder decay, so now we have 25 left. If we go another half-life to 30, again, 25 don't, uh, uh, don't spontaneously radioactively decay, only half again, so 12 and a half. And you can see this line will actually never really hit zero, which, it, which is remarkable. Um, uh, I, I, I guess theoretically it would have to after some number of years, uh, but that fraction, just based on the number of atoms, but that fraction would never allow it to actually hit, hit uh, totally zero. Okay, hopefully that makes sense to you. If not, that's something you're going to want to review for sure. We get some problems. We have some problems. Uh, weathering can remove some of the parent or daughter isotopes, which distorts the ratio. Uh, we can also go through metamorphism. And metamorphism actually dis destroys uh, some of the daughter or parent products as well, too. Uh, and so if that happens, or if argon, for example, in the, in the case of potassium argon, um, that can reset the radiometric or time clock. So there are some methods to prevent error. And uh, it's, uh, again, well beyond the, the scope of this course, just to have a basic understand understanding is important. So in general, for metamorphic or igneous rocks, we use radiometric dating. For uh, sedimentary rocks, we can use carbon-14 if they're young rocks. But remember, carbon-14 dating only goes up to maybe 80 or at most 100,000 years. Uh, but index fossils certainly can help to get uh, a better indication of, of at least uh, relative age. Principal isotopes, you're going to be given this sheet. And then there's a little practice quiz if you want to go through this. And we should be done with 2B. Oh, this I should stop and chat about this one here. I can't remember if I even asked this on the test. But why would X indicate a younger age than Y? Well, it's because of this intrusion. And all along that intrusion, I should really have little dashed lines to indicate that something has occurred. And if you remember... Uh, this is one of the types of metamorphism, contact metamorphism. And remember that that resets the time clock in X. So we would expect that X would indicate younger than Y, even though, in fact, it would have been deposited at exactly the same time. This intrusion, X and Y, is the same. But radiometrically speaking, X is younger only because of this intrusion, which has caused contact metamorphism, which has reset the time clock. I think there's a question like this, so you should go through this. This one actually is fairly obvious. Uh, I won't give it away. I'll let you sort through it. And yes, you can work through these ones as well, too. You do have the answers to work from here as well. Okay, that's 2B. Wow, we're flying through this review. 3A. Oh, look at that. Let's just zoom in a little bit here. Uh, by the way, anybody know what fossil this is and what time period it's from? Uh, it is a trilobite. And it's absolutely an amazing specimen. Uh, and if we go to trilobites here and find them, they existed during the Cambrium, which we can see was 490 to 544 million years ago. Incidentally, I should mention that um, there are two different versions of this handout. And um, if you don't see an exact match, let me know. So if I, in other words, if I give you a question that does not refer correctly to the time periods on here, uh, let me know that. Uh, these time periods have changed even in the time that I've been uh, teaching this course. So that, uh, that is, that's an important consideration, obviously. Okay, uh, let's see. Precambrium, 87% of geologic time. And I know I've said this many times, it sounds like a broken record, but just a reminder that the time charts that you, that you put together, first of all, they're due if you haven't handed them in. But secondly, remember that 80% of all the time is in the Precambrium, and we didn't include that in our timelines. And the reason is we would have needed an additional 8.11 meters of paper, and it would have been a waste of paper because uh, there wasn't a lot of information to put on there other than formation of the earth, formation of the oldest rocks, and earliest uh, uh, types of life. Paleozoic, ancient life, zoe means life, uh, meso means middle, and ceno means new life. 
Why the divisions? Okay, so extinction events, most commonly. Let's go all the way down here. Oh, look at that cute little dog. That's Moodle. He's a good little boy. All right. Uh, anyway, we don't need to memorize all this stuff. Um, we're not going to go through kingdoms. This is more geology. What you need to know is um, the class, the family, uh, whatever the name, the one Latin name that's associated with the main fossil groups. Okay, so foraminifera or hole bearers. Okay, that's our plankton. Should be able to recognize that. Uh, brachiopods, remember these are symmetrical. Uh, echinoderms, derm I think rhymes with worm and it's kind of wormy appendages. There's always five. Uh, now, there are no appendages on any of these, but they are broken into five and we'll usually prominently, anything that I would give you in the test, it would be very obvious that there was some sort of division or star-like uh, image superimposed on top of the fossil. Uh, arthropods, insects, uh, spiders, all that sort of thing. 80% of all living species are arthropods. Absolutely amazing. Uh, okay. You can go through the rest of this. Uh, make sure that you know them all, please. And let's see. Okay, unconformities. How, and how do we know? We've worked through one of these already. I don't think I'll work through that again. Uh, we've talked about this. Again, the intrusion would cause uh, contact metamorphism which would reset the time clock at X and possibly remove some of the daughter products. Okay, the one thing I did not talk about, which we should quickly go through, is types of fossils. Original preservation, carbonization, replacement. Original preservation is where we can actually see original body parts, like bones and teeth. And I always think that um, we normally see color. And original preservation should look exactly as it was. Again, there would be some color. It wouldn't just be the color of the surrounding country or, or matrix rock. Carbonization, this is soft tissues preserved. So we most often see this with leaves, uh, where it looks like somebody's actually uh, drawn it. The color will be a dark color, often black, and uh, uh, that's carbonization. It's just an outline of what was there, a black silhouette. Replacement, dead animal or plant replaced slowly by minerals. Typically it's hard body parts, but not always, as we saw in the case of the Burgess Shale. Permineralization. This gives us a lot more detail and internal structures are, are often still intact. So if we were to break uh, a permineralized fossil open, we would actually see some of the internal components of that fossil. It's remarkable. Uh, mold formation. So this literally is um, a mold of the fossil. And if we were to fill it in, if it were to be, be filled in, uh, perhaps with, um, uh, with hot fluids over time, we would actually get a cast that's created that shows that fossil. Now there's nothing that's original from it other than the outside appearance of it. So that's very different, you can see from permineralization where we have some internal structure. How does that compare though uh, to replacement? Well, replacement and um, uh, a cast can actually look awfully similar. And so I wouldn't ask you to differentiate between those two. That's, it's not easy to do that. Uh, other than the, the, the color of the, of, of the matrix rock, but uh, okay. Fossils and trace fossils. Trace fossils are non-biologic in origin. There are trace fossils that, uh, were, that show that something had lived there. And the most common one I would think would be tracks, for example. Um, I, also <laughs> I also mentioned coprolites, which I don't think made its way into the test. I really should add a coprolite question on there, just for fun. What makes a good index fossil? Uh, it existed for a relatively short period of time, widely distributed around the world, easily identified and readily preserved, which often means hard body parts. And normally, um, we would expect that they would be found uh, in a shallow marine environment because easily preserved or readily preserved has to do with two things. Number one, the hard body parts, but also it needs to be in a location where it's going to be um, more likely that it actually is preserved. And again, shallow marine is the most common environment for that. Okay, uh, evolution and adapt or and natural selection. You can read through these, have a quick look at them. Uh, adaptive radiation, yeah, we talked about that fairly extensively in class. Punctuated equilibrium, this is rapid change over a short period of time. And I don't know, I th I hopefully that covers most of what you need to know for the test. Good luck to everyone. I hope uh, I hope the test goes well for you.